Let me just get right into it. There hasn't been a horror game or new major horror media release I've looked forward to since Resident Evil Biohazard as much as its sequel, Resident Evil Village. If you were on the channel way back in February of 2017, just after the release of Resident Evil 7, you already know how much I love that title, and still do. I thought it was secretly genius. And it was, though its status as a masterpiece of the new age of horror games isn't such a secret anymore. Resident Evil Biohazard set a new gold standard for immersive horror and subtlety in storytelling. And while we screamed, celebrated, and held discussions over it for months after release and when Resident Evil Village was announced, we all came to recognize the mutated elephant lurking in the corner of the room next to the wickedly tall woman whose vampirism infected just about all of the internet with a different kind of thirst. Resident Evil Biohazard was the new gold standard. It was lightning caught in a bottle, a moment of glory that reinvented and reinvigorated a stale franchise and gave new life to a genre that had been languishing everywhere outside of indie game hits. Could Capcom really top their breakout performance and pull off this kind of success twice? Everybody wants a sequel when something incredible is achieved in fiction, but too often, we find that follow-ups just don't measure up. Resident Evil Biohazard set a brand new bar, and Village needed to meet it and exceed it. Not just in gameplay, but in narrative, atmosphere, and artistry. So, did they pull it off? How did this story turn out in its second half after such a thrilling beginning? I hope you're ready to journey through quite a tale. And to get you ready for all sorts of narrative twists and turns before entering the village, our friends at Audible have come by to provide us with a well-timed supply cache. From birth to death, one fact of fiction remains true. We all enjoy being told fantastic stories. Some of you even experience Nightmind this way, listening to videos while you take care of some errands, drive around, or develop windows into other worlds yourself. But no matter what you're doing, or what fairy tales you care to hear, be they dark, mysterious, or encouraging, Audible can provide whatever you're after. Audiobooks, podcasts, the occasional experimental audio play. You can explore a wide range of content from fiction to non-fiction, urban legends and frightening facts, comedy and romance, suspense, true crime, and taboo tales. And if you need an auditory safe room to collect yourself and prepare for the road ahead after some frightening listening experiences, Audible even has meditation and sleep offerings available. Feel like hearing what other fans of Resident Evil had to say about Village after this video? You can check out three different podcasts on Audible just for that. And if you're into more survival horror experiences, especially concerning hordes of monsters, check out one of my all-time favorites, The Passage by Justin Cronin. Audible has a member plan called Audible Plus, which grants full access to the Plus catalog. Listen all you want to thousands and thousands of popular audiobooks, originals, and even ad-free versions of your favorite shows and exclusive series. Right now, Nightmind viewers can start listening with a free 30-day Audible trial, granting full access to those thousands of audiobooks, original entertainment, and podcasts included in the Audible Plus plan. Just visit audible.com forward slash nightmind or text nightmind to 500-500. Again, that's audible.com forward slash nightmind or text nightmind to 500-500. I'll also have the link available in this video's description. There will always be stories to explore when we're in the Nightmind office, but whenever we aren't gathered, Audible has you covered. Major thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video and the special offer for Nightmind viewers. Now, for our expedition into the village, there are a few ways we can tackle this, but I think the best course of action is to follow the original mapping of my previous video. The scales have changed this time around, favoring a deeper balance of theme work and lore for discussion of Resident Evil Village. But anyone who's played it knows there's still plenty to be said for the primary question going in. Is it scary? In 2017, Dissection of Biohazard introduced the steps taken to set players up for a non-stop horror show. Immersion, priming, and stimulus. No one can forget what it felt like to arrive at the Baker Estate and the incredible work that went into making us feel our journey onto the grounds. Transitioning flawlessly from normal life and deeply atmospheric Louisiana woodlands to the disturbing and decaying sights of a family home that's harboring some nasty secrets. Immersion factor, emotional priming, and light points of stimulus all succeeded in our visit to the Baker Estate. And in Village, we're given the same stage-by-stage -stage introduction. Albeit with a brutal transition between the normal world and the horrors of Resident Evil's universe in the form of Chris Redfield and his team's attack on the Winter's home. But we can't say that was surprising. If you've seen the trailers, you knew it was coming. Waking up in the snow outside of a ruined van in the oppressive dark of early morning, however, sets the stage for our entry into the village. 
The sights are vastly different as you travel through the snow, but rest assured, this is the format of Resident Evil 7's guest house journey coming back, keeping us ignorant of what we're walking into while introducing elements that get our hackles raised. If you're a little bit claustrophobic, this segment will do wonders to strike nerves. The darkness, the abundance of plants Ethan has to crawl through, and just how narrow the path through the woods feels all contributes to a sense of growing panic that urges you to find a clearing. Ethan's labored and nervous breathing, and the shivering in his breath from the cold, increases our sense of worry as we navigate, until the sight of torn up crows along the way provides real visual concern. Lessons on atmospheric noise and biohazard are in full effect. You hear the cracking of branches somewhere outside, the scuffling of whatever killed these crows nearby, and even the sound of a crow caught in some branches as it tries to escape after being wounded. By the time you spot a flash of whatever danger is ahead, you're well aware that you're not alone, and it's only a matter of time until you have an encounter. Ethan finds his way to an abandoned home, and just outside, you can spot environmental details that ramp up the sense of dread. Dead fish in the water next to the bridge, a shed full of dead pigs. Blood on the doorstep leading into the home drives the point deeper. You're on a collision course with something lethal. Once inside, all you can hear are the noises Ethan makes and the ambient sounds of the house. The darkness has followed you in too, making every step more difficult. And to take just a bit of advantage of your emotional state, the developers place some staring taxidermy animals in the shadows just above the stairs to the basement. With no idea how this situation can play out, we make our way to the bloody cabinet and open the doors, only to find a rat. This was the expected scare, which means whatever we're in for is still waiting. Sure enough, take a few steps and... Enough stimulus has been provided by this point on top of atmospheric immersion, priming, and overall pacing to let us know that we aren't safe even once we step into the light of early dawn. Someone abandoned this home, something violent was just hiding in it, and we're still unarmed and alone. But we have to travel on, and once we do, we come to another Baker Estate moment, witnessing a point of dread and beautiful scenic detail, Castle Domitresque. Entry into the village proper introduces a lot more stimulus and moments to be afraid, you're always watching your back, and if you were in question of just how bad the invisible threat you're dealing with is, here's the mutilated body of a horse outside the first stop to show you. Fun fact in case anybody missed it, when you go into the home and step out again, the horse is dragged away, giving you all the more reason to take some very cautious steps as you explore. It becomes clear that even while this is an introduction, there's plenty to explore in the village later for you. The well in the backyard needs a device to operate it, you can come across a padlock to a gate you can't open yet, and there's generally just a lot of area that seems accessible once you've made enough progress. Exploring at this stage really sets the tone for just how badly the village has been massacred. And once again, the Resident Evil team shows that no one is better at photorealistic graphics, scenery, and environmental storytelling. That's a high mark that greatly exceeds the previous amount in Biohazard. Environmental Storytelling You'll find it just about everywhere, showing how much history there is to this place and hinting at how much tragedy has occurred. Walk through a ruined home and you can observe how the walls have caved in and the way that wooden beams have splintered. Tour the cells in the castle and observe how many people were tortured and experimented on in the pursuit of making more vampire daughters. The slaughtered goat heads hanging over the road add a nice touch of storytelling and dread, and Ethan asking out loud what happened here gives him a bit of characterization. Another high mark for this entry because Ethan does say what's on his mind more than before, and it never spoils the atmosphere. It's not long before Ethan encounters a survivor, though promotional footage did reveal how this moment ends. What is a surprise comes next as Ethan is dragged through the floor, bringing him face to face with a corpse. Navigating this crawl space reveals a dumping ground for bodies, and while we anticipate having to maneuver around them, we don't expect this. Ethan Winters and his left hand. Again, damage in a traumatic, gory, horrible monster attack we didn't see coming. He wraps up the wound after dealing with the lichen, and for the rest of the game, that finger is gone. 
But now we have a gun and we're finding ammunition in the next house that we enter. So everything should be good, right? The ability to pull cover over an entryway is great, even if it doesn't help with the lichen who drops in from the second floor. These guys are a lot more vicious than the molded, and they know how to dodge, making confrontations riskier. Lichens are a different horror feeling than the molded were as enemies. Less grotesque, but more immediate in producing a fight or flight response. And when you find a shotgun on an upper level while escaping from more, you immediately realize what your encounters with them are meant to be. Lichens are all about adrenaline and the fear of missing your movements and the dread and panic of suddenly turning a corner and seeing a molded tear away from the wall. That can be said of a lot of the fights throughout Village. You'll be horrified or terrified for the initial presentation of an enemy, but then it's all about running and gunning. You don't have time to be scared when you've got a pocket full of shotgun ammo and you're sick of dealing with these freaks. By the time Ethan has his near-death experience with the horde of lichens and spots the hag, you've undergone Resident Evil Village's equivalent to the Biohazard Guest House and the first stage of the Baker home. You've been immersed, primed, stimulated, scared, shown once again that Ethan Winters can be harmed beyond any of our expectations for a main character, and taught what your battles are largely going to be like. In all, the village arrival stage paints a strong picture of the full game experience, including your run-in with a villager and the hag. Characters are much more tragic, worried figures or strange fairy tale types in this story. You really are in a village of shadows, finding your way through a mad fable caught between medieval and modern times. And that balance between the darkest of Brothers Grimm tales and classic Resident Evil experiences follows you from beginning to end. That balance is the foundation of your journey, and it's something to take into account at all points. While there are excellent, and I do mean excellent, moments of horror and terror that fully remind you this is the team who made Biohazard and brought us the Baker family. The consistent sense of fear, dread, and constant scream-inducing surprises of Resident Evil 7 aren't present throughout Village. In a nutshell, no, it's not as scary as Biohazard, but you can tell the mood was meant to be different for this one. And while it's not the marathon of near heart attacks found on the Baker estate, Village always remembers it's a horror game. If there hasn't been a good scream or dread-inducing moment in a while, rest assured, they'll usher one in and make you remember the good scares they have provided at the same time. A very clear attempt was made to be the strongest possible blend between the old action-heavy Resident Evil titles and the new first-person ultra-immersive survival horror established in Biohazard. That kind of balancing does mean the fear factor was going to take a hit, but the efforts that would have gone to keeping that level all the way up are excellently allocated in a new direction. If Resident Evil 7 didn't feel enough like a game for you, Village does, and the different areas you'll find on your mission to cleanse the land of its monstrous lords are all quite different from each other, reminding you of the level design priorities for old platformer games. Make them unique, make them fun in their own ways, and put them all under one roof. No single zone is too similar to another, and that's a really enjoyable and applause-worthy point. Even the village proper is its own zone with its own feeling. You even feel like you're in a different place all its own just when you're visiting with a duke, and he needs to show up in existing spots all over the map. It takes talent to do something like that. Mentioning the duke and the different zones makes me immediately want to jump to the characters and a heavier side to this title than seen in the previous. Themes and lore. But there's a few more things to be said on the subject of fear and horror experiences in Village. As mentioned, the overall fear factor and constant underlying tension everywhere outside a safe room in Biohazard isn't present here. And that's alright. We get great scares and fearsome moments scattered throughout, not just in a long run during our introduction to the village. But there is one zone out of all the areas in village that remembers just how good it felt to unnerve, disturb, and terrify you as a player. It's an area so good that when Resident Evil's official Twitter account ran a poll on which of the four Lord's domains was the most enjoyable, 24,968 players voted, and it came in second with 30% of the vote, right behind Castle Dombitresk, House Beneviento. Everyone I've spoken to about it agrees. This is the most terrifying, pulse-pounding, and concentrated horror experience in Village. House Beneviento was so good that it's at this point I'm going to remind you that if you care to play Village yourself, stop the video now, pick up Village, play it through, and then come back to me. Resident Evil Village is a fantastic game, and if you care to experience its high points unspoiled, do so. Especially if you want the scare factor. House Beneviento should not be spoiled. 
and I'm extremely glad the promotional team kept it shrouded in mystery leading up to release. According to the Duke, none of Donna the Dollmaker's playmates ever come back, but after conquering Castle Dumitresque, you're surely ready for whatever's out there, aren't you? You open the door with a winged key, get your weapon ready for whatever lichens or zombies might be lurching on the path, and head into the cold and mist, soon encountering headstones and dolls, many hanging from the trees. The scene has changed, there's no music, the ambient sounds are different. You're in a very new environment, and the first real danger you encounter is a classic psychological primer. The long, crooked rope bridge over a deep chasm. You hurry across to the other side. Ethan... What? Ethan, come with me. There's something I have to tell you. Mia? What's going on? Rose feels different. Ethan, you have to fix her. What the hell is this? Everyone leaves me. Even Rose. I don't want to be alone. This can't be real. No, it can't be real, but it's happening, and you're not used to this. Mia's ghost leads you to a massive grave surrounding one luminescent stone covered in dolls, a member of the Beneviento family who died as a child. To proceed, you're asked to do something painful. Give up your memories. Surrender the photo of me and Rose you've been carrying, and you'll be allowed passage to a cavern with an elevator. Does this journey feel somewhat familiar? Not in its appearance, of course, but in its design, its pacing, its unique touches. You've been put through your paces in Castle Domitrask and feel ready to fight anything, right up to a mutant dragon. That kind of self-assured attitude and some new resolve to save your infant daughter on top doesn't make for an easily scared player. So, the Resident Evil team decided to wipe the slate clean. You've been introduced to the world of the village once. You're used to it now. So, you get to experience a new world inside it, which means going through immersion, priming, and stimulus all over again. In my video on Resident Evil 7, one of the main points of the secret genius in the game design was in showing the player that the rules no longer exist as they know them. The game was unpredictable and could ruin you and Ethan Winters in ways that you'd never experienced. Village showed you that a lack of the rules is still somewhat in play. First by biting off a good chunk and a pinky from Ethan's left hand, then by slicing off the right hand directly in front of you in the castle, making you run around in a panic while Lady Dumbitresque seeks her revenge. This moment is funny in retrospect, but when it happened it was shocking, horrific, panic inducing and came with no warning. A trick so nice they did it twice. Your left hand was forfeit in Biohazard, the same chopped off hand isn't safe in Village, and the one that's never been mutilated isn't safe now either. But Ethan does retrieve his hand, glue it back on with the Miracle First Aid Liquid, and get it functioning again. So, you can still be surprised, and horrifically, but you still put your severed hand back on and kill a dragon with it. What more can they do to you? Bring in House Beneviento, a new orientation experience to show you're no longer on familiar ground remind you that you can and will be surprised, and to do something truly cruel once you step through the door. Remind you from every angle that you've been in a pretty haunted looking place like this before. Once you go inside, you come face to face with a scene that brings back fierce memories of the Baker Estate. The wood furnishings, the scuffed up old floor, the round table and rocking chair dead ahead, the antlers on the wall. This isn't Louisiana, but you are seeing ghosts. Every step feels like your original biohazard experience, and the light creaks and atmospheric sounds of the home keep you on edge while exploring. Could there be something around the next corner? You know there could be, but you haven't been here before, so whatever's lurking is entirely up to the imagination. The cruelest trick House Beneviento plays at first may be in how it allows full exploration of its open areas before you reach the elevator to the basement and find nothing in it. The scare is coming, you know it is, but you've been kept on edge so far in a place that's bringing up a lot of bad memories and tensing up your nerves. 
The upstairs room especially is a very subtle touch. Watch this. That rocking chair was moving, but ever so slightly. Just enough to make you wonder if it actually was moving, or if you were hearing your own footsteps and looking around too fast. But the idea of the rocking chair moving by itself, already an alarming primer, brings to mind memories of Grandma Baker and the danger she represented. Then at last we go to the basement, where there's plenty more to see, all without any music or hints of immediate danger. You carry on through a few more stretches of hallway until you reach the end room. Nothing can help you in here except whatever you pick up, and you're in the basement of a monster's house, forced to play autopsy with a mannequin of your recently deceased wife. And while this change in scenery and events is scary, you still haven't been released of your tension. Even as you make progress, there's another room to enter, and another, and every puzzle solution or item found brings you closer to... something. As you navigate the basement, you don't know if you're due for an attack, it goes on for so long that you're completely unsure now if there's even going to be an attack, but that doesn't take the edge off. It only makes things worse as small changes or events occur around you, like the picture of a pregnant woman slipping off one of its cords, or Mia's ghost at the end of a hallway. The best turn of the screw occurs in the projector room. Once you solve the puzzle, you're locked in place as the film plays, giving a nod to found footage horror and an additional dose of anxiety, as whoever holds the camera examines a dark, deep well with a ladder. When that same well appears after unlocking the next door, every nerve in your body tells you the same thing. This is it. You're in for it now. This is the scare. It has to be. You need to go down into the well. They've shown you the well already. It's going to be at the bottom, whatever it is. You get to the bottom. Nothing hits you. There's the breaker box key hanging from the hand. You don't want to take the breaker box key. But when you do, nothing explodes out of the water. So the next fear comes. You don't want to climb the ladder, because now it must be at the top of the ladder, right? So it wasn't at the top of the ladder. They're just going to keep playing with you. But you have the breaker key. That means there's only one thing left to do, right? Then you see it. The mess of blood on the floor. Something long and round sneaking into the hallway. An umbilical cord. Another set dressing. Another thematic scare tactic. Gotta keep going, right? Your nerves are stretched out as long as that cord. But you've got to keep going. I recorded my gameplay footage, but at that moment, I wish I'd been recording myself, just to show you how effective that scare was. I screamed the kind of scream Let's Players give when they're actually scared on camera and aren't overplaying it for viewer reactions. I screamed, I ran, I yelled, I panicked, I just kept running and running, I got cornered trying to escape through a door that was locked now, and I died screaming while I was swallowed alive. Then I slumped back in my chair, sighed, and laughed for a good long minute. That was so worth it. 
That scare had so much build up and was so perfectly executed. It wasn't even a jump scare. It only involved the noise growing, then the monster emerging from the darkness. First in just a slight glimpse of something shifting in the shadows, then a shot of the top of its head to know there's something in there, and finally, out it came, straight down the hall in all of its hideous, horrible glory. The way this monster so perfectly melts out of the dark, this is the most effective use of lighting in the entire game. And when that baby does come into the light, it is the most disgusting, horrible thing Resident Evil has ever shown me. Trapped in a hallway, unable to do anything but just turn and run, scared and without a weapon. Beautiful work. This is the kind of moment that so many games try to go for and just can't manage to do it. And it didn't involve any sort of jump scare. This is Master Work at play. The fear doesn't end here either, even when you realize looping the monster is the solution. Because the dark is so strong and its voice is so loud that you don't even know if it's about to turn the corner and take you down. But when you pass through the door unlocked using the child relief item and enter the basement, you find a new horrible discovery when entering a bedroom. The action option over the bed allows you to hide, which means you're going to need it even this far from the monster. Then of course you take the fuse, plunging yourself into severe darkness and initiating another encounter with your nightmare baby. Waiting out the danger like this in Resident Evil feels incredible. You're just holding your breath and hoping you made the right choice of hiding place. And it really, truly works. To go from being a one-man army to running scared in the dark this way, it is incredibly effective. Once you put the fuse into the breaker and activate the elevator, of course, the baby comes for you one more time, and it's a harrowing effort to get the door open and hope you make it in time before you're eaten. Returning to the house means facing Donna and Angie, whose laughter mocks you all the way to the main area. The rattling of certain dolls during their chorus of laughter as you play hide and seek makes for a much tenser experience, since there's no telling at first if standing around one for too long means you'll be attacked, or if it's just trying to scare you. When I finally put Angie down for good, and Donna, I felt relieved, I felt victorious, and I felt sorry that I had to go. House Beneviento had taken my weapons, scared me, terrified me, thrown the most hideous thing I've ever seen from the Resident Evil team at me in horribly close quarters, and I wanted more. <laughs> I was actually sad that it was over. Running around the house after killing Donna, I just kept hoping to find something extra, something more, but eventually I had to take Angie as my souvenir and leave. To see something as concentrated in its survival horror nature and psychological torment factor as House Beneviento right after Castle Dombitrask, that was so incredibly rewarding. For an entire area of the village, the game remembered its strongest points from Biohazard and thought up new tricks in the same vein, and it left me with an immediate need to keep playing and see what else I could experience like it. It's unfortunate to say that nothing in village quite touches the heights of House Beneviento, some of the moments in Heisenberg's factory bring back that sense of dread and impending demise, but as far as terror goes, nothing beats that basement. That's our journey complete as far as fear goes. For the player, that is. Now we get to examine a different treasure, the theme of fear that runs throughout the story and lore of Resident Evil Village. This moment sure does feel familiar, doesn't it? A family of twisted, sadistic freaks gathering around you. A prisoner who just wants to get a member of his own family back. It's interesting, isn't it? How easily Mother Miranda and the Four Lords gathering reminds us of the dinner scene in Biohazard. That's really no accident. While expanded theme details surrounding the fear of an everyday resonant evil in Biohazard were well hidden and explained through environmental storytelling and documents, the presentation of a corrupted family and a community's resonant evil are quite on the nose in Village, and they hit harder, too. Something that may seem out of place is the length that developers and writers went to introduce us to the remaining members of the community, only to see them torn apart right after a group prayer. The sole survivor, Elena, brings herself to shoot her own father after he turns Lycan, then deals with the horror of what she's just done. This event shows a lot of Ethan's backbone as a character. He's very quick to let her know on no uncertain terms that she did the right thing, because it wasn't her father anymore. And yet, when the house is burning and she and Ethan are about to escape, the father stumbles upstairs, still turned but having a brief moment of clarity. Unable to accept the change that's occurred and fight on with Ethan, 
Elena goes with her father to the flames. Ethan's reaction is strong enough for him and the player. This place has gone mad. Why the fuck is this happening again? Oh, shit! That was a lot to put a player through as a supplemental experience but it fleshes out the reality of the situation in a way we only caught in glimpses during Biohazard when helping Zoe and having a flashback in which Jack is lucid. You're not just running around shooting down bioweapons to reach a goal and marveling at all the nasty corpses of civilians along the way. These are people experiencing hell, their homes and lives torn apart by an evil they couldn't anticipate or fight, betrayed by their savior. To confront the idea of your own community members, your own family turning into monsters in front of you, savaging people you know and love, that's absolutely horrific. And in Resident Evil Village, grappling with that very fear and how to deal with its possibility is the beating heart of the story. Love of the family, and especially love for one's child. This is what drives our hero Ethan Winters and our villain Mother Miranda. We come to learn through dialogue, evidence, and documents that Mother Miranda wasn't always the raven-winged witch of the village. Once upon a time, she was simply Miranda, a scientist who had wandered into a cave to die following the death of her daughter Eva during the outbreak of the Spanish flu. It was in that cave she discovered a rare variant of black mold, Megamycete, which flooded her with knowledge, revealing how it kept the consciousness of bodies it absorbed. Miranda believed that if she fed her daughter's body to the mold and found a living vessel, she could effectively bring Eva back. Miranda began to study the mold and learned what it could do to living people. She returned to the village and implanted villagers with samples from the Megamycete, then began experimenting on them in secret to find Eva the perfect vessel. This was just after the Spanish flu, of course, which lasted from 1918 to 1920, meaning Miranda's discovery and initial infection by the Megamycete allowed her to live for nearly a decade, frozen at the age of her discovery and mutating into the form that granted her powers. 100 years, experimenting on villagers in secret, even creating a parasite out of the Megamycete she called a cadeau to speed up the process, and nothing worked. Some villagers, like Dombitrask, were infected with a cadeau and became nearly perfect vessels, but most turned into lichens. This is how Mother Miranda formed her family of lords. You can see through the wall carving and the existing statues in the village that there were four houses already, and if you're persistent in collecting treasures for the Duke, you can find evidence that there were village lords before the current set. Mother Miranda's experiments generated lords that she could put in power in place of the old house members allowing her further control and assistance while she looked for the perfect vessel. But what sort of vessel was she looking for to house the consciousness of her Eva? Most likely a candidate who would be a true daughter in Miranda's new mutated sense. Shockingly powerful. Incredible. A being with as much regenerative power as the Megamycete itself. Someone who could not die again. This is why Dami Trask was considered nearly perfect. Her regeneration power was beyond belief and she still looked quite human. Villagers who were infected using the cadeau and didn't turn into anything useful became lichens. Considering how long Miranda's been doing this, that explains the immense amount of them in comparison to what must have been the active village population just before Ethan's arrival. She held the leash on the lichens until she no longer needed to. Miranda met Oswell Spencer as a young medical student who became the president of Umbrella. He was thoroughly impressed by the Megamycete, but considered his discovery of a virus in Africa to be the true way forward in human evolution. He adopted the symbol in the cave where Miranda showed him the work of the previous houses as the logo for Umbrella, to pay tribute to their time together and all the things Miranda taught him. Miranda mentions that along the path of her research, she was approached by an organization who said they would assist her. This was a black market bioweapons company called The Connections believed to be led by former team members of Umbrella who didn't believe in the company's direction under Spencer. This information is found from the Baker Incident Report, included in the DLC pack. Miranda gave the company some of the mold in Eva's DNA. They used it to create the bioweapon we later came to know as Evelyn. 
The pictures in Miranda's lab show her involvement in the process, including this shot of Miranda holding an infant Evelyn. Every iteration of this bioweapon from A to E resulted in failure for Miranda's goals, a suitable vessel for Ava. Knowing how Evelyn clones aged at an extremely rapid rate, we can understand why Miranda deemed the experiment defective, though the connections were clearly fine with shipping out an Evelyn to a buyer, who crashed her carrier ship and created the events of Resident Evil Biohazard. Miranda notes that the Evelyn experiment wasn't a total failure. She learned about Rose through the organization, and realized that she would be the perfect vessel. There was some interference, but I was able to verify her suitability. Now my research is finally complete. Ava, I have waited too long to see you again. Events during Village from Chris Redfield's perspective and this document point to a mole within the BSAA who works for the Connections. There wouldn't have been any way for Miranda to discover Rosemary's existence otherwise, especially the location of the Winter's home. That mole provided her all she needed to know. A man and woman infected with the mutamycete had survived the ordeal, their DNA changed in the process, and they had a child together. A natural-born, healthy Evelyn. The vessel Miranda needed had been created. This photo is incredible to find. Miranda, the last successful Evelyn clone, scientists from the connections who created the Evelyn bioweapon, Mia Winters, and Alan, her assistant in transporting Evelyn to the US. Miranda and Mia were well acquainted before the events of Village. The maternal aspect of Mother Miranda seems to extend beyond being Ava's mother in the early 1900s and creating a small family of mutants. The form of the Cadeaux in this picture suggests that what she's been doing all along is fertilizing her own eggs en masse to create the parasite. She's the mother of all the Cadeaux, so anyone infected is carrying her children around as a controlling force that grants their mutation. Rosemary Winters was the only option for her to have a true child, because the Cadeau was all Miranda could produce after her infection. And that's what it all comes down to. Miranda spent a century experimenting with the mold and infecting villagers in order to create a vessel she could feed to the Megamycete, which would override that person's brain with the consciousness of Ava, bringing her daughter back to life. In opposition to her now stands Ethan Winters, a man spared from death by the mold himself, fighting to get his daughter back. You have a mother who lost her child and a father about to lose his own fighting to the death over the same baby, but each comes from a very different place. The shape of the Cadeau and the House Beneviento sequence probably clued you in well enough already, but there's an understated fear in the story for Ethan that serves as an echo of the secret theme within Biohazard, a parent's fear of their own child. The flashback to an argument between Mia and Ethan regarding hospital test results for Rose reveals an issue between them. There's a concern about Rose's potential condition as an organic being. We see the evidence of this in Ethan's office through a report from Applefeld Memorial Hospital about Rose. All results show no issues. Patient is in good health. But, results for additional fungal pathogen tests will be provided by BSAA. BSAA, the organization Chris Redfield works for, tracing, fighting, and containing bioweapons and their makers. This is further proof that the Winters family was betrayed by a mole within BSAA working for the Connections. But for our current focus, it outlines the very real fear that Ethan and Mia have to live with. In Dolphy, Louisiana, they faced a crisis spurred by a young girl named Evelyn who wanted a family. She was the bioweapon and the blatant evil within the home, using her powers as a bioweapon to get her way, a literal monster child. In putting Evelyn down, Ethan had his first real experience of playing an older male disciplinary role to a young girl who was out of control. And now, he's the father of an infant daughter, born from a mother who was infected by Evelyn's mold. The idea that Rose may not be okay is what Ethan is struggling with. In the flashback, he insists that Rose will be fine, but at the dinner table with Mia, who of course was Miranda posing as her at this moment, he needed to talk about what happened in Louisiana. This isn't surprising. The DLC for Village is labeled the Trauma Pack, and its description reads, Years after the tragic events in Louisiana, Ethan has tried to move on, rekindle the traumatic memory of his past with these items. Living in the wake of a traumatic experience is very much like this. A lot of day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week flip flopping between optimism, hope, and feeling fine, and then feeling the doubt creep in and having to hash out something you've already addressed or talked about a lot, even if it was a while ago. Ethan's fear runs deep, and he's taking turns beating it and having to confront it again. What if Rose is an Evelyn? And if she isn't, what if she's a Lucas Baker? Ethan's experience taught him before he was even a father that evil can come from your own family, your own children. 
So what is he supposed to do now? He loves his daughter, clearly, but he's afraid of her in a way we can only see expressed in moments when he's not really saying it outright. House Beneviento was a psychological horror trip. It exposed what Ethan was actually scared of. You can spot a hint of it here, in the hallway, where the baby makes its appearance and first comes crawling down. Yes, this is blood on the wall, but it's very dark blood, isn't it? Hints of red, but mostly black, like another dangerous black substance that he's seen on the walls of a home. Rose's blood, tainted by Evelyn's mold. That's what Ethan is deeply afraid of. He's dealt with an Evelyn before. How is he supposed to deal with one when it's his own child? There is a silver lining to this issue though, and it's the kind that comes to take over the whole storm cloud. Ethan learns after Castle Damitras that Rose really is different, and as he continues on, he discovers more about how valuable she is as a bioweapon. Ethan's fear is at least partially real. Rose is not entirely human after all, and that was a factor even before she was turned into crystal and split into pieces. Still, he fights on to save his daughter. Whether she's a bioweapon or not, he loves her and he's her father. He hasn't given up yet, and he won't give up even when he knows the truth. The parent-child relationship and the fears that come with it run deep as a theme throughout Village. We see it when Elena has to fight her father, who turns like him. We see it with Lady Domitrask and her daughters, who were created just as she was, and how it actually does hurt her when Ethan manages to take them out. Mother Miranda insists on being known as Mother Miranda to the village and the lords, and her parasite, the Cadeau, is shaped like a fetus. Even the Megamycete's heart changes to reflect a Cadeau under the will of Miranda. Ethan's story has always been about one of the most valuable reasons to fight your fears. Love for another person, even when it seems hopeless. He fought through the Baker estate to rescue Mia, even after she attacked him and cut off his hand. He fought through the village to rescue Rose, even after finding out she was a bioweapon and wouldn't be a normal child to raise. He would run the risk of raising her and finding out she's an Evelyn after all, his absolute worst nightmare, because he loves her. And in the end, Ethan does for Rose what so many parents tell their children. If it ever came down to it, I'd give my life for you. Ethan's demise at the end of Village does feel cold. We spent so much of everything to fight with him. Energy, courage, time, emotion, and plenty of screams. And he saves his daughter, but he doesn't get to raise her. It hurts a bit to sit through the credits, but the post credit scene, showing us how much his sacrifice was not in vain, really does provide the light at the end of the tunnel. Rose looks just like her mother, and even if she didn't get to know him, she still loves her dad and visits his grave. Biologically, part of her is an Evelyn, yes, but she is Rose at her core, and she's working with the BSAA or whatever organization performs its role in the future to put down bioweapons with her own mutation. Chris Redfield also has apparently fulfilled his promise, acting as a father figure in her life according to the dialogue, though he probably acts more like a mentor and gruff commando trainer being Chris Redfield. But Ethan did it. He faced his fear head on, accepted it, saved his daughter, and made the ultimate sacrifice for her. She grew up to be something the BSAA and anyone who's fought bioweapons had probably hoped to see for ages, a result of genetic experimentation that actually lives to help and protect people rather than torment and terrorize them. Rosemary Winters really did grow up to be her father's daughter. And that's it for our visit to Resident Evil Village. Altogether, a really solid and enjoyable experience, with its own touches of brilliance, unique scares, and very memorable new characters. I had a lot of fun with it and savored its peaks of fear, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Shout out to Audible once again for their sponsorship and the offer for Nightmind viewers. Much appreciation to you for viewing, and big thanks to my supporters on Patreon, who make up my own little village. They not only keep the channel running, but empower the Nightmind Index for new and emerging unfiction projects, which is growing all the time. You can join and help support Nightmind Endeavors for just $2 a month, which also gets your name shown at the end of the video. Stick around to see all the Patreon supporters this month, and if you enjoy Nightmind content, please consider joining them. Or, at the very least, subscribe to the channel if you're a viewer but haven't done so. That way you can catch the latest uploads as they arrive. That's all for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and like a helicopter flying towards the horizon after another adventure, you'll be seeing me again real soon. Sleep tight.